Hello and welcome to Insight Germany. My guest today is the president of an iconic German company, one of the most renowned and successful classical music record labels in the world, Deutsche Grammophon. Mark Wilkinson took up his post just a year ago and moved with his family to this city, Berlin. Yes, I said moved because the boss of this quintessentially German company is British. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you, um, Robin. And that has to be my first question. I mean, we, I know we live in a globalised world, but Deutsche Grammophon is sort of an iconic German company. Its headquarters is here in mm -hmm. Berlin. I believe Germany is its second biggest market mm -hmm. after Japan. So. Why is a Brit at the head of the company, apart from the fact that you're obviously hugely talented? <laughs> oh, thank you, Robbie. That's very kind of you. Actually, my predecessor uh, was an American, um, and he was in the job for 10 years, so it's not unusual in this day and age to have a, a non-German, if you like, running a company like, uh, working at a company like, uh, like Deutsche Grammophon. I've been with the company that, that owns Deutsche Grammophon for over 20 years now, and I've been lucky enough during that time to work with, with many people at the label. So I've always had a connection. When I was in the UK, I was responsible for selling and marketing Deutsche Grammophon records and working with their artists in the UK. So I've always been lucky enough to know a lot of the people there. When the post came up, I put myself forward, came to meet some of the bosses over here in, uh, in Germany at Universal Music, um, and was lucky enough to get the post. I was thrilled. But is it a bit different? I mean, you, you've transferred here to Berlin. Yes. Presumably, the people in the most of the people in the office are Germans. Is there a slightly is it a different way of working? I mean, how do you yeah, find I mean, it? I, you, I, I, yes, I found some quite big differences from the working culture that we had in the UK to the working culture that that did exist and partly still does exist at Deutsche Grammophon. There was quite a lot of formality. There were perhaps too many meetings, um, maybe too many closed doors. Um, so I've tried to, over the period of time, uh, change some of that. But it's a very young company. You know, lots of young people there. I'm probably, um, bar one or two people, um, probably the, the oldest person there. So there's, there's a lot of energy and there's a lot of enthusiasm for, uh, for the business there. And now maybe a little less formality uh, than, than they used to be. And do you find they're open to that? Yeah, I mean, very much so. I mean, especially, especially the young people. And, you know, we're a very creative business. Who wants to be working behind closed doors when we should be, you know, we're in the music business. Mm. We should be listening to and interacting with, with music, you know, every second of every day um, if we want to do our jobs properly. So we, we've made a few changes. And as I said, the, the atmosphere is a, a little bit more informal now and maybe a little bit more friendly than perhaps it used to be. Is, is it first name terms? It's definitely first yeah. name terms. Which... which, which we're both Brits. We sort of that's obvious to yes. us, but that yes. isn't an obvious thing here in Germany. Is no, it? I, I don't yeah. think so, and it's something that <clears throat> you know that I can be quite uncomfortable with, really. But no, it's definitely first name terms, and it may even be nickname terms, if mm. it's uh, if it's appropriate. Yeah, and I believe the language of the company is English. Yeah, too. very much so. I mean, it, it's an international company serving an international business community, if you like. You know, we have branches of Universal Music in, in 60 countries around the world. So no, every meeting, um, certainly if I'm involved, every meeting uh, is in English. And of course, most of my colleagues, if not all of them, speak perfect, flawless English. Yeah, it's difficult to learn. How's your German going? The German's actually not going as well as I hoped it would go. <laughs> I did start, I started lessons when I first arrived and the lessons would start at 7.30 in the evening. So at the end of quite a long day. Yeah. Um, and I just, I found it too taxing, to be frank, at that, at that particular time. And when everybody around you is, is actually more than happy um, to speak English. Uh, this as, as is a major problem, isn't it? I found that when I first came here. Mm. I had to make an absolute decision to, to sort of uh, at home or something to speak in German, yes. to learn the language, because everybody, certainly here in Berlin, wants to, oh, you're English, they're and they English. want to Let, practice their English. Absolutely, let's converse and, and practice in English. Yeah. But it's something that I might return to. In fact, I think I will return to early in the new year as a resolution. <laughs> we have it here on tape. <laughs> we'll keep you to that. Um, now, you arrived in April last year. Yes. Um, and with your wife and two teenage children. I'm That's intrigued right. to know, how are the kids liking they, it? They absolutely love it. They go to... Yeah. The, the British school here in, uh, uh, here in Berlin, um, their lessons are in English, but they themselves, I'm very happy to say, I'm very proud to say, have, you know, embraced the language 
Um, and are they mixing yeah. with, with they're, they're, German? Yeah, they're, they're mixing yeah. with, with German children, but children from the international community as well. In fact, it's called the British School, but they're probably um, some of the only British children actually at the school. It's very much an international school, but the lessons are in English. Because well, I, I just imagine I, I, I once had teenagers, they're a bit older now, but mm -hmm. I imagine when you get home and say, oh, by the way, we're, we're leaving, and you're leaving all your friends here in Britain, and we're off to Berlin, wasn't that, weren't they... It was, against, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a, a tough decision, but actually I brought them here. Um, we spent a weekend here when it was minus whatever it was in February of 2012. <laughs> anyway, it was extremely cold. Um, but we had a, a wonderful weekend. We were very well looked after. We visited a few schools. We had a lot of fun. We looked around the city and together we made the decision. And it was definitely the right decision to make. Oh, you all made the decision We all made the decision though. together, oh, right. absolutely right, yeah. Um, it's not so far away, Britain, but I wonder, and, and you obviously had impressions of, of Germany before, which I might ask you about later, mm. but any surprises, anything that has surprised you that comes straight off your... Uh, not, I mean, nothing really that, that springs to mind. I mean, people have been very, very welcoming. I mean, I was lucky enough to know a lot of people uh, in the company when I first arrived because we've been working remotely, if you like, mm. for, for oh, a good okay. few years. And we had a wonderful lady called Sabina who helped us uh, uh, relocate. So no, no real surprises. I mean, I think I was prepared. I knew the people. Um, I'd, I'd visited the, the, the city and the offices quite a few times prior to that and also when the company was in Hamburg, um, which it was for many years, yes. um, Deutsche Grammophon, before it re relocated to Berlin. And obviously I'd been visiting artists and, and attending concerts and the like um, over the last few years. So I, would, I wouldn't say there were any, any surprises, but you know, we embraced um, uh, the country and the people here have, have embraced us and we're, we're very thankful for it. Good. Deutsche Grammophon is one of the oldest record companies in the world, but it's never rested on its laurels. It's also known as one of the most innovative. One of the things they created a few years back is the series of yellow lounge concerts, classical music in a club surrounding. And we attended one recently with one of the top stars in the classical music field. Anna Sophie Mutter playing Brahms may not be new, but the venue sure is. was the first time that the German violinist performed in a club more used to hosting all-night raves. I gave it a lot of thought because it's such an unusual format. Everyone knows clubs as a place to dance, but not as a forum for classical music. And after last night, I love the idea. Putting classical music stars into clubs is a real crowd pleaser. While Anna Sophie Mutter rehearses with pianist Michael Abramovich, concert goers are already queuing up outside. And not all will get in. The Asphalt Club in Berlin has a capacity of just 800 and will be packed. The relatively reasonable entry price of six euros buys music fans a 20-minute bonus performance from the two virtuosos before DJs take over. Tonight with a blend of electronica, pop, and classical sounds. The night is part of the Yellow Lounge series, designed to connect young clubbers with old-school music. It's amazing to see the combination of these two components. It's a great event. It's just my first time here, but I already like the atmosphere and the people. It's great, but you do feel like you'd want to experience it in a different atmosphere. In classic style, in a really big theatre where the music might sound even more wicked than it does here. And compared to conventional major venue classical concerts, these types of performances draw far younger audiences. 800 people, most of them young, who might be hearing classical music for the first time. And they listen so intensely, whether it's Brahms Hungarian dances or a Dvorak romance. I felt it was a gift to classical music. 
And it looks like the concertgoers of tomorrow want plenty of encores. Do you think they will be the concert goers of tomorrow, or do you, is it really a promotional stunt? Or no, I mean, do you think they? I mean, I hope so. I hope that mm. you know, if somebody is coming along to an evening like that and engaging with classical music with a musician of that incredible stature for the first time, then there's a chance, and even if it's a very small chance, that it will lead to something else. Um, then we need to continue to do this sort of activity. Mm. It was one of, one of the hottest clubs in Berlin that night. It was an extraordinary evening, really. I mean, over a thousand people gathered uh, to see one of the most accomplished musicians um, of our time really throw herself into it and yeah. engage yeah. with a much younger audience. You know, people like Anne-Sophie Mutter, they don't have to do that, but they were persuaded to do that. Um, and it was, it was a wonderful evening. Yeah. I mean, she is one of many great artists on your uh, label. Yes. It's, it is an international company, but is there an emphasis on German artists? Um, I wouldn't say specifically um, or deliberately there's an emphasis on German artists, but some of the German artists that, we, uh, that we're lucky enough to represent and work with happen to be some of the very best, um, like Anna-Sophie Mutter, for example. But mm. no, I mean, the roster is truly... Uh, international with musicians and singers and orchestras and conductors from uh, from all over the world, from mm. the UK, from the US, from Japan, from Italy. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it is true to say that, and actually in, I mean, in, in recent months, we've signed one or two exciting young uh, German acts who bring something a little bit different uh, to the label. But at the same time, we've just signed a, a fantastic new violinist from Serbia uh, and an incredible pianist called Daniel Trifonov from Russia. So it is truly international. Mm. Wherever the talent is from, we want to hear about it. <laughs> now, I'm interest, intrigued to know your opinion on this. In, in Germany, uh, performers and people in top posts, you're one of them, you're in a top post, but the perf there are performers as well of mm. cultural institutions here. There's an inordinate amount of non-Germans. I mean, just in this city, you can mm. think of Daniel Barenboim, yes. Simon Rattle, Barry Kosky, the Australian at the Komische Oper, Donald Runnicles yes. at the Deutsche Oper. Why do you think this is? Well, I, I think, I mean, the, the city and the company is, uh, and the country um, is a sort of cultural hub. I mean, so much, so much goes on here. Uh, and I think these sort of institutions need to attract the very best from around the world to do what they need to do. Um, and so that's probably why. Mm. I mean, it's all, there's also obviously a lot of uh, subsidy here, state subsidy yes. here. Um, many opera houses and orchestras receive very generous state mm. subsidies. Um, but Deutsche Grammophon is a commercial business so is it actually difficult to make money in this, in the classical world? I think it's, I mean, it, it's, it's always been difficult, but it's not impossible. I mean, we are in the record business um, and it, it is a business. And at the end of the day, we have to commercialise the music that we make on behalf of our artists and, and on behalf of the company. Mm. It, but here's a strange thought, though. If, if, for instance, you make a recording of the Berlin Philharmonic... Yes. I don't know, is the, are they one of your artists? Yes, certainly. Yes, We've made a couple, <laughs> couple of recordings with them in the um, last yeah, couple of months, yeah. in fact, yes. And, um, but they're subsidised. So if you make a profit, do you give some money back to the state? <laughs> um, <laughs> not as far as I know, or not as far as I can comment on, but, of course, we have a commercial contract and arrangement um, with yeah. them, as we do with with all artists and, and, uh, and, and parties that we deal with. But we also have a, we, we have a responsibility, and this is interesting because everybody in the company feels it. Not everything um, can make money immediately, and not everything is obviously commercial. Um, but Deutsche Grammophon has a 115-year history of bringing classical music, serious classical music, um, to the world. And sometimes it's hard to sort of square that circle, as it were, in mm. terms of the commercial world. But sometimes there are things that we just, we have to do because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for posterity and it's the right thing to do to save music of this nature for audiences of the future. Mm. 115 years, you mentioned 115 it. Years, nice yes. time to bring in oh, yes. this photo of yes. the man great? who started it all. That's right, Emil Berliner. Who invented, he was quite an inventor, I discovered whilst researching this, that he has something to do with the invention of the helicopter. Gosh. But we, we won't go there now. This is, of course, his gramophone. Mm -hmm. And um, 
that was one of his inventions. And another photo I wanted to show, which is an iconic Nipper the dog. Now, I didn't know. I thought this was HMV, his master's voice. I think it was HMV. In a sense, it still is uh, HMV. But through Universal's acquisition of EMI uh, just 12 months ago, in certain territories, not in all territories, but in certain territories, this very iconic trademark has now passed back into Universal's ownership. Oh, and we, so, will, we will see a bit more of it in well, the future. Well, I hope so, yes, yeah. I hope so. It's, okay. it's actually been adopted by um, one of Universal's labels called Electrola, mm. um, based here in Germany, in, in Munich, in fact. Mm. But it will be also open for us to use um, as and when we feel it's the right thing to do. And it's so iconic, obviously recognised by yeah. audiences and music yeah. lovers around the world. Mm. I said about the company being innovative, I mean, Am I right that, that um, Deutsche Grammophon was the first one to use magnetic tape? I think so. The yeah. first with CDs? Yes. And the first online shop? That's right. right. I mean, the, the, the CD is particularly interesting because, of course, I think that was in 19, 1983. Um, and Deutsche Grammophon with Herbert von Karajan um, was the first to issue uh, a CD of, of, of any music, not just uh, classical music, mm. um, during that period, which obviously really started and began an incredible revolution uh, in our business. And then, of course, with the, with the web shop that you mentioned, um, which is still, I'm pleased to say, uh, up and running. I mean, again, that was, that was a bold step uh, to take, where you're dealing directly with, uh, mm. with the customer anywhere in the world. A very complicated operation, um, but, but one that's still, still up and running. A quick mention uh, of what's coming up later. You mentioned CDs. We have the most incredible prizes to give away. Later in the programme, you'll have to stay tuned. <laughs> Meanwhile, I want to ask you about um, your childhood. You had a musical childhood. You're a flautist. Yes. And actually play, played a number of instruments. Yeah, I, I did. I, yeah. I, I played the flute, inspired um, to pick up and play the flute by James Galway, as I think oh, many, yes. many people were during yeah. the uh, during the 1970s. My brother was, yeah. There we are. I mean, he was omnipresent on, uh, on television mm. Uh, mm. during that period. And you know, everyone, everybody wanted to be a flautist. Everybody wanted a golden flute. Right, oh yeah. Now this wasn't flute playing, but this is a nice, embarrassing photo of you, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> you very much. Actually, where are you? I'm uh, um, second from the left on the top row, with a, actually with a flute in my hand. That's, oh, all right. That's HMS <laughs> Pinafore. St Mary's Junior School, 1970-something. Yeah. Um, but very, very happy memories. Yes? Yes, indeed. Uh, oh, and I, yes, you have a flute you can see in now, yes. Yeah. And, and I wanted to show another... This is, now, this is the photo I like. Uh, Tell us about yes, this. Okay. This is... Well, actually, that was taken at, taken at uh, school probably in about 1984 or 1985. Um, and I, I taught myself to play the guitar because I wanted to be in a band. Um, I play the flute in the orchestra, um, but I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, and so that's what I did, self-taught. Also a number of other instruments, the mandolin uh, and the lute, because, I mean, as you'll know, Robin, if you can, if you can play one string instrument, you know, it's quite easy to migrate to another one. Mm. Um, but, but great days. I think that was taken in the rehearsal just before one concert that we did for the boys there. Yeah. But were you... I mean, did you want to be a musician or were you always interested in the management side? Um, I don't think I ever had any dreams of being a professional musician, um, but certainly I wanted music to be um, a constant part of my life, uh, if you like. Um, and I went to study music um, from school um, at the University of Durham, um, which, again, playing was... Uh, practical music was a very important part um, of, of one's day. Um, but there was a lot of emphasis also on the history of music. Mm. Um, and at the end of that, actually, like many people, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, but what I did know was that music should be a part of it, of, of mm. whatever that would be. Yeah. Do you play air guitar in the office? Still, Sometimes though? I do, but Sometimes. certainly... Um, but you have may, open doors that, now. But, but that may be the only time when the door, <laughs> when the door is closed okay. and, the, and the lights are off. Yeah. Turning, actually, to something serious now, an extraordinary story of triumph against adversity. 75 years ago, on November the 9th, was the infamous Reichspogromnacht, the night when the Nazis made a series of planned attacks against Jews throughout Germany. Over 30,000 Jews were arrested and incarcerated in concentration camps. 
To mark this anniversary, Deutsche Grammophon have released a documentary about some of the people who survived one concentration camp in Theresienstadt because they were musicians. Visiting, visiting some of the few survivors still alive today was the violinist Daniel Hope. Ah, oh, music. From first tone on, it goes directly into our souls. We are not more on this world. Als Musiker geboren. Und außerdem bin ich der Musik dankbar, weil sie mir das Leben gerettet hat. Kannst du dich an den ersten Tag hier erinnern, als du ankamst? Ja, natürlich. Und also wir hatten alle furchtbare Angst. Ja? Und als wir hier ankamen und ausstiegen, wir mussten aber unsere Sachen, äh, konnten wir nur, was wir anhatten, mitnehmen. Und das andere mussten wir auf dem Bahn, Bahnsteig lassen. Und dann bin ich hier angekommen und habe Kaffeehaus gelesen und das ist mir ein Stein von Herzen gefallen. Ich dachte, was, na, so schlimm kann es doch nicht sein, wenn es ein Kaffeehaus gibt. Ja? Gab es die Konzerte? Wie oft, Bitte? wie oft gab es die Konzerte? Jeden Abend. Jeden Abend. Für uns Spielende war es göttlich, gewusst zu haben: Heute Abend spielst du. So ist es ein Wort von Gott, an den ich nicht glaube. <lacht> <lacht> Wir als Menschen, ich rede jetzt nicht nur als Musiker, wir als Menschen haben eine Verantwortung, die Geschichte am Leben zu erhalten, weil es endet quasi aus der ersten Person, wenn es ein Coco Schumann oder ein Alice Herzogmann nicht mehr gibt. Man will ja nicht das Publikum herunterdrücken. Man macht es nicht, weil das Publikum sich schämen soll, sondern Eben die, die heilende Kraft der Musik oder mal nachdenken, was diese Leute erlebt haben. Hola, sie tritt in die Zeit, nimm sie in die Jazz. Dies ist bald im Suiradicic, ab bei dem Domusas. Schechtleute, Stichsitze, Sarutzeitze, bis mir mehr. Something wonderful, musically anyway, that came out of a very dark part of German history. My guest is Mark Wilkinson, president, CEO of Deutsche Grammophon, um, who released that. Uh, obviously, as I say, a dark part of German history. What were your impressions of Germany as a teenager? Obviously, you musician, you loved the music, and there's a big connection there, but uh, what were your impressions as a teenager? I suppose, we, I mean, we'd have to think back to... 1989 and when the war came down and just how exciting that was um, for all of us who at the time were um, were teenagers and we wanted to come here we wanted to come and, and share with the people of Germany the youth of Germany um, you know the, the incredible and intense excitement that you could just see coming out of the the television pictures that were that were beamed around the world and I mean I think it's one of those moments you'll always remember where you were when Nelson Mandela was released when the Berlin Wall came down, you know, a few of those iconic moments, certainly in, 
in in our recent history. So I would I'd, I'd probably look always look back to that mm. that moment in uh, in 1989, which of course is 25 years uh, next yeah. year. Yeah. When did you actually first come here? Did you come here as a teenager? No, mm. I came here um, probably in my <laughs> mid 20s uh, again to visit the company um, when I was working for Britannia Music in. Uh, uh, in London, I came over to to visit Deutsche Grammophon in Hamburg, as were, as they were then, to, to get to know some of the people and, and to do some business. Mm -hmm. Talking of business, one of your artists, I'm looking for him here. Where is he? This must be a major part of the business, André Rieu. André Rieu, yes. I mean, not yeah. strictly a Deutsche Grammophon artist, I have to say, but a, a universal music artist, ah. and one with whom I worked very closely um, in the UK for a number of years, and a, and a fascinating man, uh, a driven man, uh, and a man who believes in, in the power of music to change and transform and energise people. A driven man in what way? The... I mean, ju just in terms, I mean, f first of all, I mean, he runs his own company. The orchestra is a company. Everybody is an employee uh, of André Rieu. They own their own studios. They make their own records. They mm. put on their own tours. They cook their own food. I mean, it's like a, a small PLC in its own right with André Rieu being the CEO, if yeah. you like, or the president. And a little insight into him as a person. I believe in his dressing room, he reserves a part of the dressing room for his socks. For something very special. I see yeah. that you have a, a, <laughs> a penchant for socks there, uh, Robin. And, yes. uh, Just, <laughs> can we get that in the camera? What have I got on today? I, do, I get letters about these, you know. It's not... Uh, there we go, a quick close-up of the socks. This is... Uh, one of the highlights of the programme. Sorry, oh, that's Andre, something, that's more something important. That, uh, that, that you and Maestro Andre Rieu share in common because, as you said, um, in his dressing room, there will always be a, a, a part of um, the space there reserved for brand new, um, crisply ironed socks. Really? Yes. And he would choose one? I think but... he'll, he'll choose whatever he, he thinks is right yeah. um, for the show and for the occasion. Oh, OK. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, we, you heard that first here. Uh, another picture of uh, a man, actually, we, we, we had a lot to do with here at Deutsche Welle. Oh, yes. He, he's there, sort of, not kneeling, but at the front there, mm. Gustavo Dudamel, Gustavo Dudamel the, yes, the, the, the great conductor. That wonderful, inspirational... Uh, conductor from Venezuela, yes, who we've been lucky enough to work with now at the Labour for seven or eight years now. Mm. Yes, um, and Deutsche Welle actually made a, uh, a, um, a film, The Promise That's of right. Music, mm -hmm. about this ex the extraordinary Venezuelan. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think what it's called. El Sistema. El Sistema, Absolutely. where every child yes. in Venezuela gets uh, the opportunity to play uh, an instrument. And I have said before on this program, I think if. If, if that happened in the whole world, it would be a better place for it. Now, we do have a questionnaire that we ask our guests to fill in, and I did like yours very much, uh, and I'd like to ask you about a couple of these things. You've said the coolest living German is Boris Becker. Are you oh, big, Boris Becker. Yeah, big, big tennis a, fan? A big tennis fan, um, and what an incredible uh, sportsman, and mm. an inspirational sportsman um, to, to many, many people around the world. And what an achievement to be the youngest winner of Wimbledon at the age of 16 or even, even 17, but also incredibly graceful in defeat. I remember seeing the post-match um, interview in 1988 when he lost to Ed Berg, and he was very, so relaxed. Mm. He said, it's OK. Nobody died. Nothing really yeah. happened. Yeah. I just lost a tennis match. And it was one of the coolest things um, that, that you could ever hear. So a, a wonderful man, an incredible sportsman. It's sport. great to hear, yeah. and it'd be very surprising to any to Germans because in Germany he's not mm. so popular now. Is that true? But we won't okay. go into that. You're also your favourite German place. You put down as Hoppergarten. Yes. You must tell the people what Hoppergarten. Well, Hoppergarten is the um, the racetrack, the race course in the east of Berlin, which, as far as I understand, uh, in in the twenties and thirties, was the place. It was the racehorse destination um, here in Germany um, and recently post the war fell into dilapidation and, and uh, elements of, of ruin but in fact has been bought um, yeah. quite recently a few years ago um, by a businessman called Gerhard, uh, Gerhard, can't remember his surname, but anyway he bought it and he's um, injecting a lot of money into it and is trying to return it to its former glory and it's just a wonderful place 
to be and spend time with friends uh, and family and yeah. bet or gamble um, if that's the sort of thing that you like to do. But a, a great place to go on a summer and it, Sunday. Here and are you a man of form or would you put your money on a horse called Beethoven? Um, <laughs> if you I, see what I, I mean. Actually, I'd probably, I'd probably do both. <laughs> um, I'd do Beethoven because, you know, there's always a chance, but um, I, I do like to study the form as well. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's a, a wonderful place to be. You've put down as good German characteristic grasp of the English language. We don't need to explain that. You've put down as most annoying German a few people in my building. Well, always, <laughs> yes, a few people who will remain nameless. Um, <laughs> but but knowing, knowing also that they probably feel the same about me, so that's OK. Yeah, OK. And the best thing about living in Germany, proximity to other places, I think yes. that's geographically clear, yes. but Sunday closing. Now, yes. that's interesting as yes. a Brit, because in, in Britain it's 24-7, isn't 24 it? 24-7. And what do you like about the fact that it's... I mean, what, what we liked immediately was the fact that we were forced... Forced. I mean, we like spending time together, but, you know, one would get into the habit in the UK of if you hadn't bought anything on Saturday or you short of milk or needed to buy some clothes or, or whatever you needed to do, you could do it on Sunday and you may not do it on Saturday because you could do it on Sunday. You're forced to plan a little bit more, um, but then you, you have the, you know, the joy and enjoyment of planning a day, uh, a day together um, mm. as a family. And I think that's, that's very, very special uh, and something that certainly brought us, I would say, um, even, even closer together uh, uh, as a family. It's a, mm. it's a wonderful thing. OK, and finally, um, you put down as German culinary achievement asparagus, which is... And, and beer, of course, goes without saying. And also useful German product, the currywurst. Oh, the curry yes, yeah. I mean, it's just wonderful, simple comfort food that you can buy virtually any time of the day and, and on any street corner. OK. Uh, and, uh, the German I, I equivalent of fish and chips. Perhaps. Absolutely right, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, the currywurst is a staple of the Berlin diet and we went along to what is most probably Berlin's best-known curry station. Curry 36, Berlin's currywurst mecca, is located in the ethnic Kreuzberg district. Nearly a thousand customers are served daily. Students, immigrants, office workers, tourists and older folks all rub elbows here. This isn't about fine dining. It's hungry people who want sausages, spices, and lots of ketchup. We asked Danny Reinhardt, a 22-year veteran at Curry 36, what really makes up a currywurst. It's a well-kept secret. Each butcher uses his own blend of spices in the sausages, so the head butcher and my boss agreed on the recipe, and we workers never find out what it is. Another key ingredient, lavish quantities of special ketchup. The recipe is also a secret, of course. I think the ketchup we make is really good, but the flavor is still a bit neutral. It sounds funny, but that lets you spice it up the way you want. Make it a little hotter, or use more paprika or Worcestershire sauce. You add your own personal touch. It's always busy behind the counter, but customers are served with a smile. Currywurst and fries cost under four euros. It's an inexpensive yet satisfying meal. Standing in line at Curry 36 is the norm and has been for 30 years. It's simply good management, good quality and value. It's always full here. And when we have visitors, say from southern Germany, we bring them here and tell them, this is Berlin, this is Kreuzberg. It's just great. I've been coming here, I don't know, for 30 years. Want something healthy? Go elsewhere. Currywurst is just something you treat yourself to, whether at 9 in the morning or well after midnight. Right here at Curry 36. You see, we'll never find out the recipe. Did you know there's a Currywurst museum? Actually, yes, I did know that. <laughs> I haven't been there yet, but I'm planning a trip. There's a museum? Yes. Everything yep. in Berlin. There's a sugar museum. I didn't know about the sugar museum. You no, know, there are there's museums for everything. Now, having the boss of Deutsche Grammophon as your guest does have its advantages. Mark Wilkinson has brought with him some amazing gifts to give away. There's no Deutsche Grammophon museum, but we do have a CD box set of the history of Deutsche Grammophon. It's 50 CDs, and the other bigger box set is of a hundred CDs, which is the history of classical music. I'm very 
Um, I'm very envious already of the potential winner. These are real gems. There's also, we've just added another one at the front there, a CD, because we had our earlier on the program, some Vorjak from Anne-Sophie Mutter. And because these prizes are so fabulous, you have to answer a question. <laughs> I hasten to add, I didn't make up this question. I blame my producer. Where did I get my musical education? Which school of music did I go to? Here's a clue. You'll find the answer on our website at dw.de. OK, lots of information for you. Here's the address to write to, insight at dw.de. Write your answer to us, and maybe you'll be one of the lucky winners to be picked out of the hat. I, as I say, I'm extremely envious of these things. Um, right. You also I wanted to mention, because we were talking about Deutsche Grammophon being innovative, mm. you've just recently had a number one hit in the pop charts yes, with we did. Schiller. That's right, with the um, electronic dance act Schiller, <clears throat> who I um, saw at a Universal conference uh, just over a year ago um, and was struck by the sort of, actually, the classical and emotional characteristics of his music as an electronic dance artist. So I contacted him um, and asked him if he'd like to perhaps work with us um, and some of our artists, which he embraced uh, immediately. Um, he worked with Anna Netrebko and Helena Grimaud and Albrecht Meyer, the oboist from the Berlin Philharmonic, to mm. create an album where he, he takes well-known, familiar um, classical tunes from the last 150 or, or 200 years and adapts them in his own style. And it's been very, very successful. We created a new label, actually, to house this, a new label called Panorama, and that record went straight to number one in the main album chart. It brings Here in us back to the Le Yellow Lounge thing. In, in a, a way. sense, I mean, it does. you know, it's getting young people. Yeah, uh, and and it's a number one hit. Here. It was a number one hit, yeah, yeah. And, and it was Deutsche Grammophon's first number one. Um, I think in any pop chart, in any market, in 115 years. So something that we were wow. all very, very pleased with, as you can imagine. I want to show another picture now that I know has a bit of a story to it. This is um, in Britain, actually, but. Um, some somebody people might not recognise in the middle there is Gareth Malone, who's a sort of choir master, isn't That's he? That's right. Yeah, I mean Gareth's had a series of um, uh, of programmes on television in the in the UK over the last few years, where he brings together people from various communities, various schools, various uh, offices, um, and teaches them in his very own and very special and unique way to sing um, and to sing together. And this particular picture um, was taken when we presented one of his choirs, uh, the Military Wives Choir, with a cheque for charity for over £500,000. And that money was raised through a record that we made with one of his choirs, with the Military Wives Choir, wow. that went to number one in the UK uh, singles chart in Christmas week, which, as you will know, Robin, is, is always a very big thing. The race for the number one single in the UK um, is, and, is covered was, across the yeah, media. Yeah, of course. Yes, um, it's a huge, huge thing. Yeah. This, this choir of ladies who had partners and husbands serving in the military, in the British military mm. around the world, came together, mm. formed a choir, made a record, and beat everybody else in the chart that, that week, mm. Mm. sold 750,000 copies and raised over half a million pounds for charity. Yeah. So that's a, that's a, a special photograph mm. with, uh, with some real heart to it. Yeah. Um, a couple more before we go. The, we've put this as a photo because it's so difficult to explain. Deutsche Grammophon, very innovative. You've got an app. We have, and, yes. And very quickly show this. If, if people can see this, you can see on the left, you can four choices of Beethoven's Ninth, and those sort of dots are the orchestra, and they all sort of blink when they're playing. That's right, we call it, we call it a beat map. Yeah. Um, and the beat map, as you say, blinks um, when you hear a particular instrument or group of instruments um, from, from the And orchestra. you can follow the music Absolutely, underneath yes. as well. Follow, you have the score you and things like that. You can follow the score exactly as it's heard yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in the recording. And you can flip from one recording to another just to hear how different conductors over the ages, have yeah. interpreted what is one of the greatest symphonies. Yeah, and 800,000 people, 800, people have downloaded this. Yeah. Absolutely so, right, yes. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you about one thing. I, I know coming up, you're, you're looking 
and and you have said we can say this on Deutsche Welle, which is for the world. Yes, you're looking for Germany's favourite musical family, and this doesn't this mean if there's a family out there listening who are German, yes. they, but they're not living here, obviously. Yes. They could they could be they could enter this competition. Well, it's kind of competition. It's a search. It's not a competition. A search, it's no. a search. But the, but that's exactly what we want to do. We were we're looking for Germany's favorite musical family and as you say robin they could be living outside of germany yeah. as long as they have uh, as long as they have german roots and if you think about the von trapp family who of course weren't german they were from austria or if you think about the kelly family who actually weren't from germany either but they were very very big here um but you know we're, we're looking for people who may play instruments who may sing together as a family and who what are you going to do with them well we're going to make a record you're going to make a record Absolutely. We're going with to make a record, the whole yes. family? With the whole family, or it may be the brother and sister, it may be the mother and father, it may be the aunt and uncle, um, but that's what we're looking for. Talent that exists here in Germany um, and outside of Germany, broadly speaking, in the world of classical music, we want to hear from you. And, and they just get in touch with Deutsche Grammophon or they Deutsche send Grammophon. a... Yeah. Uh, visit visit uh, the website, yeah. ring up, ask for me. In the yeah. office, I'd be more than happy to speak to people. Yeah, and this is something that we will launch. Well, actually, today, now, in a sense, and that will take us through to March of next year, and then we hope to have a record ready to present to the public in September next year. And with the way it's going, it could be a number one. <laughs> You're getting a bit used to having some number ones. Nothing less will do. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fascinating to talk to you. Thanks very much for being with us today, and uh, thank you for watching. Um, I just should mention again these amazing prizes. There's a, a, a box set of 100 CDs, the history of classical music. There's another box set of 50 CDs, which is the history, actually, I said it wrong, it's of the Berlin Philharmonic I see here. There's also a CD of Anne-Sophie Mutter. Write in to us at insight at dw.de and you could be the lucky winner. We'll have another guest on Insight Germany at the same time next week. Thanks very much for watching. And uh, my thanks to all the crew here in Berlin. Until then, bye-bye.